That's how you change the world. Good morning. Uh, that's the men's sign up sheet right there. If uh, you haven't signed it, in just a little bit, I'm going to read the names on that. And if your name's not read, would you just go ahead and come up here and take care of that? Well, I am honored to be asked to be here today and to be able to fill the pulpit for the pastor while he's on sabbatical. Uh, one thing I know is that being a pastor, especially at a, uh, a moving church, an active church, it can really drain your batteries. It can really take a lot out of you. And what a lot of people don't understand is the things that a pastor does behind the scenes that the, the congregation usually does not see, does not hear, and is not a part of. So I am I'm blessed that he would ask me to be the one to take his place today. I'm sure he's watching through the camera, so if you want to say something to your pastor, tell him how, how much you love him and and uh, Melanie, today, why don't you turn around and do that real quick? Let's take a minute. I'm serious. Oh, that is. <laughs> Sorry, Vic. I tried. I tried. Today, we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians, first chapter, verses 1 through 10. And it's a message that really I, I believe the Lord gave me about a year ago. Uh, one night in the men's Bible study over here, I was. I was teaching and I used part of this as a reference to the teaching and it's like a, a message just came into my head. And I began to put meat on the bones of that and lo and behold, Pastor asked me to fill in for him and I already had a message, which was kind of cool. I think it was kind of like a God thing. We'll, we'll let you be the judge of that in just a little bit. Uh, would you pray with me? And then we'll begin. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you, God that you've given to us your word, that we have guidance, that we have instruction. We have the how to do this, Lord. I praise you, Father, for today, and I thank you, God, that as we listen to your word, your Holy Spirit will instruct us and guide us, Lord, in how to live, how to walk, how to love. Lord, bless us today. Make this an offering, God, that you can use in the lives of the people that hear it, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. First Thessalonians. If you're not familiar with the book, 1 Thessalonians was written by a guy named Paul with input from two other guys named Silas or Silvanus and Timothy. Now, the, in Paul's missionary travels, in his second loop around, he went to this place called Thessalonica. It was in an area called Macedonia. Uh, today it's in Greece. But as he was there, he was the very first person to ever bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people there. And as he was uh, accustomed to doing, he would go to the synagogues or to the places that the Jews met and he would teach to them out of the Old Testament uh, law and out of the Old Testament prophets, but he would also then bring that into the reality of who Jesus Christ was in those Old Testament writings and the prophet writings. And he would share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ and tell them about the God-man who became the Savior of man by his death on the cross and by shedding his blood for the remission of their sins. Now as he did this, many, many Jews came to faith in Thessalonica and they believed and they began to uh, follow the teachings of Paul and it really ticked off a bunch of the other Jews who did not believe the teachings of Paul. And over the course of time, the uh, the Jewish people who did not believe began to harass and threaten and uh, even persecute the Jews who did believe. So Timothy and Paul and Silas decided that they would leave out of uh, precaution for those who lived there so that they wouldn't be in tribulation more than what they were. And then a little bit later, Paul sent Timothy back and he began teaching at, at the church that began there. And uh, things, things took off. One of the things that Timothy did while he was there was he sent back to Paul some questions that the church had at Thessalonica. And these are questions that still echo through the church today. And y'all probably have read through 1 Thessalonians and you probably know these questions or have asked them maybe even yourself. One of them was, 
When will Jesus come back? When can we expect His return? The other one was, how should we as believers today live as we wait for Him? How do we wait? What do we do? One of the other questions that they asked Paul was, what will happen to those believers who have died and gone ahead of us before the, the resurrection and the rapture of the church? What's going to happen to them? What, what can they expect? What can we expect if we are one of those people that passes on before Christ returns? Now, those, those questions are answered in 1 Thessalonians. I won't get to those today, but I just want to pique your interest about the book. One of the things that Paul did, though, in his writing, you know, you know that man or men took the, the Gospels and they broke them up into verses and chapters, right? They, that, that's not, you know, they, when they wrote the books, they didn't do that. But one of the things about this letter is that in every chapter of the book, Paul encourages us about the return of Christ. Another thing that he does in this is he also encourages us in how we should live with hope, with joy, until the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus. So having said that, let's look at what I have titled Evidence of the Rescued. Evidence of the Rescued. 1 Thessalonians verse 1 Chapter 1 says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This three-word phrase has a lot of meaning to me. When I was going to seminary, I had a professor named Delbert Surratt. And if you're a guy who's been in the men's Bible study, you've already heard his name probably several times. Because I reference him all the time. Because he was greatly influential in my young life as a believer. Dr. Surratt would take this and he would say, the Lord Jesus Christ, he would extrapolate out what it meant to him. And he said that this is what it means when you hear Lord Jesus Christ. It's a three-phrase word that, that has such depth to it. He says, it, <laughs> it is Kyrios Eesus Christos. Kyrios is Lord. Kyrios is Sovereign. And he, he described it like this. He says, The sovereign God who loves me so much, He became man and died in my place in order to rescue me or to save me. So when you hear the Lord Jesus Christ put out, that's what is being said to you. The sovereign God who loved you so much that He came to earth and became a man to die in your place to pay your sin debt so that He could rescue you. That's a lot. If, if nothing else were said today, that would be enough. Because that is the whole of the gospel. God loves you so much that He made the way for you Himself. Now he goes on and he says, Grace to you and peace. Grace being the word caress. It is the blessing, the divine favor, a gift from God. And he adds to it peace, irene, which means harmony and tranquility. That can only come by being in a right relationship with God. Every time you see grace and peace in the New Testament together, you always see them in that order, grace and then peace following it. Now it's done that way because you cannot know the peace of God until you know the grace of God. You cannot receive and have the peace of God until you have received mercy and forgiveness for your sins from God. But when you do, those two things are... I will say promise to you, but you also have to be active in receiving those. Now, grace is always in this order. It's always to His kids. Now, one of the things that, you know, somebody might say is, well, you know, grace and peace, if, if, if a non-believer were to hear that, they might say, well, you know, I, I know what grace and peace is in my life. I, I know and, and understand what it is to be able to have peace. Well, they may know the absence of tribulation. They may know the absence of, of punishment, the absence of the consequences. But one thing about sin that is true, it always brings the ugly twins called troubles. When you sin, there is always the reality that sin has consequences. And sin will always bring with it the consequences of choices that, that are going to bring a harvest in our lives. By Paul writing grace and peace, he was expressing that he desired for us 
to always have within our life the ever-increasing and multiplying gift of God that, that we know as, as His children. Now, how can it happen? How can we know grace and peace? And how can it be something that is ever uh, expanding in our life? By walking to the truth of His Word. By walking in the light of the Word of God in our life in obedience. I have to use paper. I don't have a, a cool little computer to use. Verse 2 says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. Now this verse has a, uh, a significance to me. A long time ago when I was at a church in, in Amarillo, Texas, I was given the, the task of following up after an evangelistic meeting that we had had as a church. The, the pastor who came was a guest pastor speaker, and it was, it was a successful meeting. We had many people who had made decisions for Christ, either for salvation or for uh, renewal of, of their walk and renewal of, of their decision to, to be uh, a dedicated follower of Christ. Uh, being tasked with the follow-up meant that I, I was given the list of people who made the decisions, and, and I had the awesome job of contacting all of these people to see where they were and, and to make a... Uh, make an effort to try to encourage them to, to not just come to our church, which was one of the main things, but that they would continue in this decision that they had made. That they would continue to seek the Lord, that they would continue to become a disciple of Christ, and that they would continue to seek uh, truth from His Word and apply it to their life. Now, Pastor Scarborough, when he went back home, he called and asked that, that we give to him a list of all the people that had made decisions, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, then he called me and asked me how the follow-up was going. And every week for about six weeks afterwards, he would call me and ask me how the follow-up was going. Because he was intent on these people being reached by our church and encouraging them to continue in their decision to follow Christ. Now, I thought it was awesome because every week when he called me, I'd be able to give a report to him, but I'd also have the honor to pray with him about these people. That was, that was in my mind, amazing. That this guy cared so much that he would call and he would actually uh, desire to know, how's it going? How are they? You know, is it, what, what do you know about them? Are you, how many of them are coming to your church? You know, how many of them are, are, are involved? How many of them are getting involved? Now, that kind of reminds me, in a way, of how Jesus thinks about us, those of us who are on His list, how He feels about us once we made our commitment to Him. He desires for us to walk in the fullness of this new life that He has given to us. He desires for us to become full-fledged followers of Him in our life. That's why He died. That's why He called us. Now, when we pray for someone, it not only affects the people and the circumstances that we're praying for, but I believe it affects us as well. When you pray for somebody, if you're praying honestly, you're praying earnestly for somebody, it's going to affect you and affect how you feel about that person. And if you, as I said, honest, because there, there's a way that you can pray honestly and there's a way that you can just pray. When, you, when you're honest about it, you allow the Holy Spirit to come into the, uh, the equation and you allow Him to guide you in your prayers that you may be a part of the solution of your request. If you're not honest in your prayers, then really all your prayer is is just words. All it is is just filling time. But honest prayer changes not only us, but the situations that we're praying for. And honest prayer brings us to the place where we will obey the revealed will of God that the Holy Spirit shows us. Verse 3 says this. It begins with constantly bearing in mind. Paul was so taken by the Thessalonian believers that he says that he is constantly bearing them in his mind and heart. The constant is the word adioliptos. It means unconditionally, uninterruptedly, continually. He is always having them on his mind, on his heart, as, as he is doing his daily details wherever he was at this time. 
constantly bearing them in mind, constantly thinking about the Thessalonian believers as they were living out their salvation and their calling. Now, we've been here about three years, my wife and I, and we moved into a neighborhood that I love. I love all my neighbors, but one of them in particular is a gentleman that I, I really am fond of. If I'm working out in my yard, and I, I like to take a break about every 30 minutes probably and drink a little bit of water and sit down, look over the Ponderosa, you know, and enjoy, enjoy the bounty of my life, which is my house. And if Berlin's driving by or walking by or something, he'll, he'll stop and he'll cock his head and he'll look at me with a big old smile and he'll say, well, that ain't getting it done. He likes to, he likes to gig me. He likes to rib me and, and, and joke with me. And, and I love him for it because he's a fun-loving guy. But what I see here with what Paul was saying was he was impressed with the Thessalonians about how they were getting it done. He was in, impressed with them about how they were living now that they had come to Christ and how they had ordered their life in such a way now that they, they were yielded to the Spirit of God, to whatever the Spirit of God wanted them to do to be useful to be useful for, for the glory of God. Now, what, what was he taken by? What, what was he so uh, impressed with? And he tells us this. He says, first of all, your work of faith. Your work of faith. Now, you might read that and you might, depending upon what your background is, you, you may see that as something that's telling you that in order to have faith or in order to keep your salvation, you, you have to work at it. Or you have to do something in order to get it to earn it. And that's not at all what he is saying here. By him saying your work of faith, rather what he is saying is the good works that are produced because of your faith. Birthed out of the new life these Thessalonians received in faith in Jesus Christ. They, they now had in their life a desire to do things that brought honor and glory to the Lord. And in their life they did that. The good works for which they and we are created to do. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, what else was He impressed with? What else was He constantly thinking about as He was bearing them in His mind? He was also thinking about their labor of love strenuous, persistent, productive activities that produce spiritual fruit, labor that was sacrificial by its nature, labor that was motivated by the life-changing grace of God, labor that was offered in Jesus' name for the glory of God. And finally, he says to them, and the steadfastness of hope. So the things that really really piqued his interest in them and held his attention was their work of faith, the labor of love, and their steadfastness of hope. Now today there is something going on in our world that there's a lot of opinions about. But if you're like me, those things that I see, they, they give me a little bit of pause in my life and they make me think about a lot of things that, that I have heard and, and maybe some of the things that I believe out of the Bible that, that maybe it is true that we are in these last days. Or maybe it's, it's the beginning of those last days. The things I see, they kind of drive me uh, to question motives and, and to look at the issue of, of what people see and desire to have as results of their decisions. But all of that, all of that leads me to the truth of what I know about Jesus Christ. He is coming back. And one day, somehow or another, all of these things that I see now that give me a little bit of fear and anxiety, and I said it, fear. The things that give me tribulation in my life that cause me to pause and to wonder and to pray about all of those things, Paul saw in their life something that, that he called steadfastness of hope. Steadfastness of hope. The word steadfastness is the word hupomone. And, and it's the cousin of the word perseverance, which is hupomeno. And what it means is a, a desire and a, a, a doggedness 
about not giving up. It, 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 is, it is defined as a remaining behind, a stubborn lingering. Now the word that is added to here at the end is, is hope, el pace, which means to anticipate with pleasure, not fear, not anxiety. Hope brings into our life the truth of who Jesus is and the truth of the promises He has made. I don't have to worry about what's going on in my world because the reality of it is it's not my world, it's His. It's never gotten out of His control. It's always been within His control. And everything that I see that's happening, He has allowed to happen because it is going according to what His permissive will is according to His perfect sovereign plan. I may not like and understand the things I see, but I know and believe that all the things I see are within His ability to control. And He's going to work all of them out for my good. All of them. For mine and for yours. Now, when I look at this and the steadfastness of hope and I put together all this, you know, one, one guy I wrote, or read, excuse me, one guy I read in the commentaries said, steadfastness of hope was patient enduring, having a firm conviction that the Lord Jesus Christ was returning and soon. I define steadfastness of hope like this, waiting with a smile. Because we know what we know. I can look around me and I can see the things that are happening that, that I can't control. There's no way I can control them. But I know who does. And because I know who does and because I know who is, I can wait with a smile because He's going to work it all out. And He's going to bring it all to a conclusion. And when it is concluded, I know where I'm going to be in His presence. So it's all good. I know that that's not proper English, but, but it's all good. Trust me. Trust Him. They endured, they labored, they believed, they had the God-honoring desire because of what they knew. They wanted to reach everybody that they could with the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They also understood this, that for faith to be effective, it has to be set free. You can't... You can't hear something and then know something and then sit on that which you know. In order for faith to be effective, in order for faith to do that which God gave it to us, we, we have to take it and allow it to be set free in our life by action. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to move us to service, to do things to reach out, to step outside of our comfort zones and become Christ-like in the eyes of our neighbors. Verse 3 continues and it says, Constantly bearing in mind our work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. There's that phrase again. Lord Jesus Christ. In the presence of our God and Father. Now when I see in the Lord, in our Lord Jesus Christ and in the presence of our God and Father, I think, wow, wow, well, what a cool reminder that is to me and to everybody that irregardless of where I am and irregardless of what I'm experiencing, irregardless of, of what might be interrupting my life that I don't like, wherever I am and in whatever situation or circumstance I find myself in, I am in my Lord Jesus Christ. When I received Christ as my Savior, I was baptized into Him and His Holy Spirit was placed within me. And then I was covered and sealed by His Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And when I'm in Christ, because who He is, He is in the presence of His Father, my Father now, because of my faith in Him. So irregardless of what is going on in this world and where I might may find myself in what I may not like about this world or my circumstances, I'm reminded that I'm in Him and in Him I'm always before God. So it's all good. Again, every bit of it is going to be okay. I don't have to be uh, stressed out about it. Yesterday as I was uh, 
trying to finalize and, and, and finish this off. I, I, my wife got me a new watch, one of these smart watches. And, and I hate it that a smart watch makes me look stupid because I don't know how to run it. You know, it, 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 it's got a mind of its own, which I guess is what makes it smart, right? But while I was studying and trying to cut this thing down because I was given a time frame, which I've never had a time frame before, I've, you know, when I preached, I, I, I just preached. And my watch started tweeting at me, and, and I looked at it, and the display said, you are having a very stressful moment right now. Maybe you want to do something to relieve the stress level. I thought, man, this is, this is crazy. This is crazy. I live in a world where even machines are barking at me. We live in a world where everything, it seems, is watching us, and everything is trying to modify our life. Jesus gave us life in order for us to enjoy abundant life. Abundant life. And we can have that abundant life if we walk in the truth and, and understand and know whose we are and where we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of God our Father. Verse 4 says, Knowing brethren, beloved of God, His choice of you. Now I started to camp on this one verse because this is a verse that it, it, it speaks to me. Okay, it speaks to my heart. Ephesians 1.4 says this, just as He chose, there's, there, there's the, 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 the same word but used in a different sense, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him. Just as He, God the Father, chose us in Him, Christ the Son, before the foundation of the world. I guess this would be at the, the meeting of the Trinity. When, when they decided what was going to happen, how it was going to happen, and, and how everybody was going to be involved in this. That we would be holy and blameless before Him, Christ, our judge, but also by Christ, our judge, before Him, God, our Heavenly Father justified, sanctified, made pure and holy, holy as if the same issue that Jesus Christ has and stands before His heavenly Father. When He sees us, He sees us through Him. Now, the word cho choice and chose is the word ekloge. It means election. Those who were chosen by God. There's a guy that I... I I read. I've got a lot of his books. His name is Dr. John Wolverd. He, he's a super genius, like Wiley e. Coyote. He says this in his commentary on First and Second Thessalonians. Many modern day Christians who have gone to church all their lives know very little about election and many other Bible doctrines as well. The Bible not only indicates that God not only saves us, but He chose us before the foundation of the world. The reference is see Ephesians 1.4. Election is a doctrine often not understood completely, but believed because the Bible teaches it. If I asked you all to raise your hand, if that was true in your life, how many of you would raise your hand? You don't fully understand it, but you believe it because the Bible says so. And that's, that's okay, that's cool. But one of the things that we as believers and we as His children, we need to try to make an effort at is the things that the Bible says, not, not just to believe them because it's in there, but, but to believe them because we understand it. Being students of the Word, rightly, able to rightly divide the Word, being able to see and understand, but, but not just that, to be able to explain to those who don't understand. He goes on and he ends with this. Christians are the elect of God because God chose them before they chose Him. Now who made the first move? God. Election begins with God. Election is birthed in and by God's love. Election's genesis in me and you is faith. That's the gift of God. Election's work is completed by the triune God. Election changes us from fallen man into Christ's likeness, the image of God. 
Now, He chose us to show forth His grace to the world. He chose us for good works for His glory. He chose us for the spiritual service of His worship. He chose us for the ministry of His gospel. And He chose us for the building up of His body, the church. But one thing we should never forget in all of that is He chose us. Out of His great mercy and love, He chose us to be His, to be redeemed by His Son. Verse 5 says, For our Gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as in the Holy Spirit, wait, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Let me read that again. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Now I read that and I got to thinking, okay, so what kind of men were they? What kind of men were they like? And if you're like me, over the course of your life, I'm turning 65 in November, and I grew up in an area in the Midwest, Oklahoma, in Muskogee, Oklahoma, which is like 40 miles away from a town called Tulsa, Oklahoma, which at one point in time was the epicenter of an awful lot of uh, televangelists. So I, I've got a background with reference on, on how a lot of men were who claimed to be godly. And he's saying, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Well, I know what kind of men they weren't like because of what I've seen sometimes on television. Men who will sell you a handkerchief if you will put something in this hand over here. Men who will promise to pray for you if you will send a donation in that's tax deductible. Men who will give you something if you will give them something. And that's not what the gospel is about, folks. That is not the desire of God. That it is, it's a, uh, a business transaction. I, I read the Bible where it talks about Paul and, and Silas. I believe it was Paul and Silas. They were walking down the street in front of the temple and they see a guy who is handicapped. He's crippled over here begging. And he, they walk up to him and he's asking for them to give him something because he's, he's absolutely destitute. Paul says, silver and gold have we not, but that which we have we give to you. Rise. See, guys, today a lot of, a lot of men will, will offer ministry for silver and gold. That's not what it's about. It's not, it's not about the quid pro quo, this for that. When we're called to service, when we're called to, to be ministers of the Gospel, we're called to go and give everything that we have away. The first thing being our lives. For the sake of others. So that they can come to know Jesus Christ. So that they can, in their life, be saved. They can lose their life and find it in Him. We live in a world that has become so superficially materialistic. And it has missed up so much of the reality of what life is about. Life is about knowing Jesus Christ and making Him known. Nothing more, nothing less. I was joking with, with Bill back in the back earlier, and I, I got so convicted when I turned and walked away because you asked me, well, what, what can we get for you or what can we do for you? And I, I flippantly said something like, well, well, you can get me a new truck and put some money in my bank account. And when I said that, man, it was like I got slapped. Because that's not, that's not the heart of God. And that should not be my heart. It's not my heart. But I said that flippantly. And it bit me. What is your life about? What are you giving your life for? You see, life is something that, that you give away for something else and you can never ever return or get a refund on your life. You can't.
I'm going to share something now from my heart. I, I hope that you understand and, and hear, hear my heart in what I'm saying now. Do not settle for or accept as your spiritual leader those people who are not like these men mentioned here. Seek out those people who have the scars of servanthood. Seek out the people who understand and know what it is like to be the called of God to serve. To serve. Those servants who are humble in spirit. Not people who are haughty or vain, arrogant attention grabbers. But those who by love are moved to action. Not just words. See, any, anybody can speak words. Anybody can pray words. But that's, that's not what we're called to do. We're, we're called to be a part of the solutions in people's lives who are in need. That's what we're called to be. We're called to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world in His absence. He's coming back. But He wants us to be His body. And by being His body, He wants us to serve those in need. People who are eager to labor and sacrifice in order to help you and others walk the true path. People who are not too proud to get messy to help people clean up. I know some of the most, most sketchy things I've ever done in ministry have been some of the most amazingly profound profoundly life-changing things for others that I have done. It is such an honor to go in Jesus' name and to give in Jesus' name and to serve in Jesus' name. Scripture says if you just give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, you're doing something great. Verse 6 says, You also become imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the Word in much tribulation and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. It says they became imitators. The word imitator is mimetes. Mimetes. It's the word that we get the English word mimickers from, to mimic. They became followers of the three amigos as the three amigos were of Christ. Now why did they do that? Because remember, this is a place where the very first time the gospel was ever preached, the gospel was ever heard, was by Paul in Thessalonica. And when he preached it, huge numbers of people came to salvation because the, the Holy Spirit just fell on the place. And they, they had been reading the Old Testament. They'd been reading and hearing about what the prophets had to say and all the law and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden, when, when Paul came and started preaching about the Messiah, the Holy Spirit made their eyes open to the fact and to the truth and connected the dots. But they had a problem. They didn't know what it was like. They didn't know what it, what it meant to live like a believer. So they began to look at Paul, Silas, and Timothy and they began to mimic or imitate them because they were the only ones that they knew who understood what it was to walk the walk. And Paul was saying, man, you guys did it. You became imitators of us. You became imitators of us when you received the Word. Now here's, here's, here's a... This is a bind. I understand what he's saying here because he says, having received the word, decomai, he says they received the word with, with great anticipation and, and they were really excited about hearing it. They wanted more of it. When, they, when Paul would get someplace to teach, he would set up and he would teach, people would flock to the place. So the believers were coming, but also the guys that hated the believers and hated Paul, they were showing up too. And he, Paul's saying, you receive the Word readily, just eagerly. You were hungering for it. You were starving for the truth of God's Word. But he says also it was connected with tribulation. The word much, or much tribulation. The lipsis, which means affliction, persecution, and a heavy burden. A heavy price to hear the preaching of God's Word. These young believers were being sought out by the, by the older Jews, by the, uh, by the persecutors. 
And they were being punished for their desire to become more like Christ. Now, I look at this and I'm thinking, well, you know, what would that mean today? It would be like being left in Afghanistan. You're a believer there in Afghanistan, and then here's the Taliban. They're going to hunt you down. The Jews wouldn't kill the other Jews because they didn't have the authority or the right to do that because it's a Roman colony. But they were sure going to make their life miserable. They were going to do everything they could up to that point. Now remember, Paul, Paul you have, when you get to the point where he reads about how many times he was beaten, how many times he was stoned, being shipwrecked, you know, all the stuff that Paul had to go through and endure. But he's referencing here what these young believers had to endure. And he's saying, you received the Word in much tribulation, but at the end of it he says, in the joy of the Holy Spirit. God didn't desert them when they, when they needed Him. In fact, God showed up in such a way by His Holy, you know, the Holy Spirit God, right? Triune God. Holy Spirit is just as so much God as Jesus. He showed up powerfully in their life at that time and gave them joy. Joy and able to endure and to overcome the tribulation and the persecution, the hardship, the heavy burden that was being placed upon them because they decided to be followers. <clears throat> they became imitators. This brought me to a question. Who's watching you live out your life? Who, who is seeking to learn more about Him by watching you? Because they know that you're a follower. And, and you may be the only follower that they know. So they're going to look at you and they're going to try to see how you do it so that they can learn how to do it also. Who's watching you become more like Him? There, there's a word that, that we see in this next verse. You don't know, read the verse. So that you become an example to Paul's. An example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. An example is, is to Paul's, but it means pattern. It means a pattern for replication. What type of people should we strive to be as patterns for those who are watching us? Teachable, prayerful, gracious, joyful, patient, forgiving, loving, merciful, humble. All of those should, should be woven into our life fabric so that those who come behind us and those who come beside us can see what it is like to be like Him, our Savior. Because He was all those things. He being our pattern. He being our example. Paul said, be imitators of us as we are of Christ Jesus. All for the sake of others. Verse 8 says, For the word of the Lord is sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth. And it, listen to this. This is astonishing to me. So that we have no need to say anything. Did you get that? Paul, the missionary to the Gentiles, on his second missionary trip, when he was lapping around the... I, I, where was he at? This is the Aegean... Well, wherever he was. He was in Macedonia. You know, Philipp, Philippi was over here in Macedonia. Uh, Acacia was over here. I guess that's backwards to y'all. 
But as he's out there doing his thing, as he's out there preaching the word, seeing converts come to Christ, he sends a letter back to the Thessalonians. He says, guys, he says, every place your faith goes forward, things, things are happening. Now, Thess Thessalonica was, was at a, a junction point in what was called the Great Road and, and another road, the Ignatian Way, I believe. I may not be right on the Ignatian Way, but the Great Road came north to south down, and I believe that the, the Ignatian Way, the Roman Road, went through them. But it was, it was a trade center. It was, it was a city of 200,000 people at this time. And what Paul was saying was that because of your faith and because of how you're living it and because of what all is going on in your life, in your church, this body of believers, it is spreading out throughout Macedonia and Acacia to where we don't even have to say a word because people are hearing what you're doing. People are seeing what you're doing. And people are reporting what you're doing. Well, really, what God is doing in you. Let me get that right. What God was doing in them was having such a ripple effect that it was going out and spreading out throughout the region. Thessalonians were so focused on Jesus, the apostle and his sidekicks were behind their curve. Well, that ain't getting it done. They were sure getting it done. They were getting it done in a big way, a great way. Now, in my opinion, you've probably heard this before, so it's not, it's not mine, it's not new to me, but I think one of the greatest compliments a student can give their teacher is to become as proficient in the subject as a student, as the teacher is as a teacher. To learn and, and to be able to be as uh, rigorous on a topic or a subject as the teacher is you, you cannot compliment your teacher more than that. To become like them in knowledge. To become like them in the ability not, not just to, to, uh, to teach, but to cause learning to happen. See, I, I had another professor that said, well, teaching doesn't take place until learning happens. And that's true, because you can stand up and you can talk to somebody, you can talk, 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 talk. But if they don't pick up on what you're talking... If they don't learn what you're saying, if they can't take and apply what, what is being said, you, you haven't taught. All you've done is just spoken a bunch of words. But in Thessalonica, there, there was such a, a uh, amazing thing taking place that, that this new thing called Christianity, it, it was spreading by itself, or, or not by itself, but, but as, as a, a process of natural multiplication. Paul, Timothy, and Silas, they, they were just like, they, they had, from, from being missionaries, they had become cheerleaders. Well, one of the greatest compliments that we can give our pastor is to become a follower like him, and when I say a follower like him, I wrote this down. To be a student of the Word, to become obedient in our walk, to become spirit-yielded in our, in our testimony, to be able to be a follower of Christ like He is a follower of Christ. Now, I was in ministry for 38 years. I was a senior pastor for 20. One of the things I saw that was frustrating but so many people would come and sit and then go home and sit. They'd come and take in and they would go home and, and they wouldn't give out. You know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to let up on this one. Do you understand what I'm saying? People would come and they would listen and they would hear and, and they would think that they learned something but then they would go home and they would sit on what they had learned. They'd be stirred but not moved. Not moved to action. Not moved to do anything. Not moved to serve. 
not moved to act upon what they had heard. That's one of the saddest things I believe in the world for, for, for a believer in the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to not be moved by the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It changes everything. It changes everything in our existence. Or it's supposed to. Verse 9. I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. So Paul's saying, look, all these people that we're meeting on the road, all these people in Macedonia and all these people in Achaia and all these people over here and over there and uh, everywhere we go who have heard about you or who have come in contact with you, all of them are telling us about you and how all that you're doing in Him and how you turn from the, the idols, the dead lumps of wood or stone that that the majority of the world worshipped then to the true and living God to serve Him. Now, I don't know if y'all y'all understand. You know, there, there's several words in the Greek about uh, slave. There, there's doulos. There's uh, there's the word do you lo. There's there's like four different types of slaves. You could be you could be a slave that was conquered in war and enslaved as a result as as part of the uh, the spoils of war. You can be a slave who was uh, uh, brought into slavery because the land that you lived in was conquered, and then you know you you weren't a soldier but you were a citizen, so then you were enslaved because your army lost. Or you could be a slave that was purchased by somebody who had conquered you and, and sold you at the market. Or you could be a slave that was born into slavery because your mom was a slave when you were born. Have I totally confused you yet? We're, we're two kinds of slaves. Just to be perfectly clear. We, we are the one kind of slave who was conquered. We are the other kind of slave who was born into. There were three kinds, excuse me. We're also the kind of slaves that was purchased. We were bought with a price, right? We, we, were, we were in our new birth born into freedom and liberty by Jesus Christ, right? by His death. And, but we were also conquered slaves because Jesus defeated death and sin. Right? But either way, you're a slave. You, you can take your pick on what you think you are, but please accept who you are if you know Jesus. If you're His. You're a slave. What kind of slave are you? Who do you serve? Let me ask that question. Who is it that you, as a slave, serve today? Because as Bob Dylan said, you've got to serve somebody. Remember that old song? Back in the 80s? You've got to serve somebody. Scripture even says you can't serve two masters. You're going to serve one and hate the other. But you're going to serve one. How do you define serve? When you, when you hear that word, and, and, and as a Christian, you're, you're asked in, in your, your service, how do you define serve? How does Jesus define serve? See, I don't think He, he spoke it out in words. I, I believe that the Scripture tells us that He played it out in life. He got up one night and he, he took off his robe and he put on a towel. And he picked up 
a basin, and a pitcher. And he set about washing his disciples' feet. He became the lowest of servants in the household. That job, the washing of, of people's feet, 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 when they came in off of the streets, you know, they wore sandals back then, in case you didn't know, or they went barefoot. But when they came into the house off of the streets, off the dirty, dirt, dusty roads, the, the lowest slave in the house, it was their job to meet them at the door with a basin, a robe, or a, a towel and, a, and a, a pitcher and to wash the dirt of the road off of their feet. Jesus took that job upon Himself. He became the lowest of the slaves that night. But He also became the lowest of the slaves for you and me. He became the sacrifice for you and me. In His definition of service. He became our sin for you and me in order to rescue us from what He knew was coming. He became what we needed. He always has been and He always will be what we need. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's who He is. Now, All these people in Macedonia and Achaia, you know, when, when, when Paul would run into them, uh, please don't think that just because they saw or they heard about how the, the Thessalonians, how good they were at church attendance, you know, how, how, how faithful they were to line up before the doors were even unlocked, and how they crammed packed the auditorium whenever they were opened up and how they even stayed late after the service so that they could talk and catch up. You know, that that is what made these people understand that the gospel is true and that they then cried out because of that. You know, Lord Jesus, save us. Make us like these faithful Thessalonians. That's not what it was about at all. You know what moved the people that came into contact with the Thessalonians to become followers of It was how they lived out their life. It was the stark contrast of lifestyle that the people saw in the Thessalonians compared to everybody else. How, what they saw in the believers at Thessalonica was so different than everywhere else that they went. Everywhere else that they, they saw and knew. There was a difference in them that stood out to everyone. They were loving. They were compassionate. They were caring servants. They understood what it was to serve. They understood what it was to be a slave of Jesus. And they lived it with passion. Verse 10 says, And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Who rescues us. Evidence of the rescued. Now, last week, I was here and my pastor called me a monster. From right here. You did, Vic. You, you probably thought I was asleep over there, but I wasn't. But I wasn't offended. It brought tears to my eyes when he said it because of the reference that he used to prove it. He was talking about what I was before I came to Christ. What we all were before we came to Christ. He read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-11 through 11, and it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. He nailed me. But Paul goes on to say, but you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the Spirit of our God. I think that the key to these amazing Thessalonians, what, what, was, what, what was so uniquely different about them, because folks, there are people who are saved believers all over the world. There were saved believers everywhere that Paul and Silas and Timothy went because the power of the Gospel changes the, the lost to the saved by faith. But the thing that was unique about them, maybe not unique, but it was absolutely noticeable, was how they waited. How they waited for the return of Christ. How they waited to be rescued. What it was to them to, to not just hear the truth and go home and sit, but to hear the truth and then put together a plan to try to reach the people that needed to hear what they had just heard. What had changed their lives. What had set them free. The evidence of the rescued was how they lived. Let's do business with the Lord now. Would you bow your heads with me as we approach His throne, the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ? Lord, we come before You now. We're, we are so thankful, God, that You chose us Help us to understand and help us to remember that, that we are Yours because You chose us. You desired us. God, I pray now that as, as, as we've heard this, and Father, I pray You'll take what I've said, and God, that You would, you would use it and make it make sense, God. Speak what You wanted people to hear to their hearts, and Holy Spirit, God, would You move them to obey You. Father, that's all we desire is for You to be honored. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's how you change the world.